Today, we're tackling the concept of the eternity of the world. The idea that the universe has always existed and will always exist, with no beginning and no end. Now you might be thinking, hold on a second, didn't the Big Bang happen? Wasn't there a beginning to all of this? And you'd be right, in a way. The Big Bang Theory describes the expansion of the universe from an incredibly hot and dense state, but even that theory doesn't necessarily imply a true beginning. Some physicists and cosmologists propose that the Big Bang wasn't the beginning of the universe, but rather a phase transition, a massive shift in the universe's state. It's like water turning into ice, a change in form, not a beginning of existence. The idea of an eternal universe has a long and storied history, popping up in various philosophical and religious traditions throughout human history. Some ancient philosophers, like the Greeks, pondered the nature of infinity and whether the universe could have always existed. But let's be real, the idea of an eternal universe can be a bit hard to wrap your head around. It challenges our ingrained notions of beginnings and endings. We humans love a good origin story, a starting point to grasp onto. But what if there was never a starting point? What if the universe just is? Now I know what you're thinking. If the universe has always existed, where did all this stuff come from? Where did matter and energy come from? And those are excellent questions, my friend. Some theories propose that matter and energy can be created and destroyed, constantly cycling through different forms. Others suggest that the universe might be cyclical, undergoing endless cycles of expansion and contraction, with no true beginning or end. Of course, this is all highly speculative stuff. We're dealing with questions that are way beyond our current understanding of the universe, but that's what makes it so fascinating, isn't it? The idea of an eternal universe forces us to confront the limitations of our own perception, to grapple with concepts that defy our everyday experience. All right, let's get into some old school thinking on this whole eternity of the world thing. We're talking about Aristotle, the OG philosopher, and he had some pretty wild ideas about this way back in ancient Greece. So, Aristotle, bless his cotton socks, was convinced that the universe had to be eternal. He laid out his reasoning in his book Physics, and it's a real head-scratcher. Basically, he argued that everything that exists comes from something else, a substratum, as he called it. So, if the universe's matter came into existence, it would have to come from some other matter. But... That doesn't make sense, right? Because then, that other matter would have had to come from something else, and so on and so on. It's like an infinite regress of matter, which Aristotle thought was a load of bollocks. He concluded that matter must have always existed. Then, he went on about motion. He said if motion had a beginning, then the thing that started moving either came into existence and then moved, or it was chilling in eternal rest before it decided to get its ass in gear. Option A is a no-go because something can't move before it exists, and the act of coming into existence is, like, of movement itself. So, you need a movement before that, which is a right proper paradox. Option B is also a bust because if the universe started from a state of rest, then the coming into existence of that rest would have been a movement. And if it changed from rest to motion, then whatever caused that change would have had to be a movement too. So, motion, according to Aristotle, had to be eternal. He also had a thing about vacuums. He said they were impossible because, like, how could something come from nothing? It had to occupy a space that was previously empty, but empty space, or a vacuum, doesn't exist. So, matter, again, had to be eternal. Critolaus, another Greek philosopher, was all about backing up Aristotle's claims. He was like, look around, nothing's changed. People are still popping out babies the same way they always have. Sure, individuals kick the bucket, but humanity keeps on trucking. And just like we didn't just pop out the dirt, we aren't gonna just disappear. The world, being all orderly and eternal, has always been here and always will be. These ancient guys were really trying to wrap their heads around some seriously big questions, and their ideas, even though they might seem a bit wonky to us now, were a big deal back in the day. Alright, so after Aristotle, we've got the Neoplatonists jumping into the eternity of the world debate and things get a bit more… divine. 
Proclus, this Neoplatonist dude from the 5th century, wrote a whole damn book called On the Eternity of the World, where he laid out 18 proofs for why the world had to be eternal. And get this, his arguments were all based on the idea that the Creator was divine. So, in his mind, if the Creator was eternal, then their creation had to be eternal too. And I get another ad. Fuck's sake. John Philoponis! John Philoponis! Avada Kedavra! But then comes John Philoponis, and he was like, nah, mate, that's a load of bollocks. <laughs> In 529, he wrote a scathing critique called Against Proclus on the Eternity of the World, where he systematically tore apart every single argument for eternalism. This dude was seriously obsessed with proving that the world had a beginning. Philoponus came up with this argument called the Traversal of the Infinite, which is still kicking around today. Basically, he said that if something needs something else to exist before it, then it can't come into existence without that something else. And since you can't have an actual infinite number of things, or count through them, or traverse them, or increase them, then the world couldn't be infinite. He basically said, you can't have an infinite number of things existing before something else, so the world must have had a beginning. It's a pretty solid point, even if it does make your brain hurt a little. Now Simplicius of Cilicia, another Aristotelian commentator and contemporary of Philipponus, wasn't having any of it. He thought Philoponus completely misunderstood Aristotle's physics. He was like, this guy doesn't know his ass from his elbow when it comes to Aristotle. Simplicius stuck to the Aristotelian view that the world was eternal and was dead set against Philoponus' idea of a divine creation. They were basically having a proper academic smackdown, and it was all about whether the world had a beginning or not. So you got Proclus bringing in the divine card, Philoponus trying to shut it down with logic, and Simplicius acting like a referee making sure everyone's playing by Aristotle's rules. Right, so let's get down to the nitty gritty of Philoponus' arguments. This dude wasn't messing around when it came to proving the world had a beginning. So, Philoponus was all about temporal finitism, which is just a fancy way of saying time had a limit. He had a whole arsenal of arguments, but unfortunately his book, Contra Aristotelum is lost to the sands of time, and we only know about it through Simplicius. Philoponus' refutation of Aristotle was a six-book saga, with the first five taking down Aristotle's Decalo and the sixth going for his physics. Simplicius, bless his heart, tells us it was a proper doorstopper of a book. Now, one of Philoponus' arguments, which you can find in Sarabi's work if you're feeling particularly academic, was based on Aristotle's own rule that you can't have multiple infinities. He basically said, if time is infinite, then if the universe keeps on going for another hour, its age at the end of that hour is one hour greater than its age at the start. But Aristotle said that's bollocks, so the world can't have existed for infinite time. Philoponus' arguments were a hit, especially his argument from the impossibility of the existence of an actual infinite. He laid it out like this. 1. An actual infinite can exist. 2. An infinite temporal regress of events is an actual infinite. And 3. Therefore, an infinite temporal regress of events can exist. He defined event as equal chunks of time and said that if the universe was eternal, then the number of events before today would be an infinite number with no beginning. He then did a reductio ad absurdum thing, showing that actual infinities led to contradictions in the real world, even if they're fine in math. So if an actual infinite leads to logical contradictions, it can exist, which includes an infinite number of past events. Then he dropped the argument from the impossibility of completing an actual infinite by successive addition, where he stated 1. An actual infinite can't be completed by successive addition. 2. The temporal series of past events has been completed by successive addition. 3. Therefore, the temporal series of past events can't be an actual infinite. He correctly pointed out that you can't turn a finite number into an infinite one by adding more finite numbers. But then he got a bit cheeky with the second point. He was basically saying that the past has been built up bit by bit, which is kind of true, but it's not the same as adding numbers. So Philoponus was basically throwing down the gauntlet, using logic and a bit of sneaky wordplay to try and prove that the world had a beginning. 
He was a real stickler for this stuff, and his arguments had a big impact on the debate. Alright, so things get even more spicy during the medieval period, with a proper philosophical brawl breaking out over this whole eternity of the world thing. Avicenna, a Persian polymath, chimed in, saying that before anything exists, it has to be possible. If it was necessary, it would already exist, and if it was impossible, it never would. So, this possibility has to exist somehow. But possibility can exist on its own. It needs a subject. And if everything needs something else to exist before it, then nothing, including matter, can come from absolute nothingness. So boom, no beginning of matter. Then you got Averroes, a big-time Aristotelian commentator backing up Aristotle's view in his The Incoherence of the Incoherence. He was basically defending Aristotle against Al-Ghazali, who had tried to trash Aristotelian philosophy. But Maimonides, Averroes' contemporary, was like, Hold your horses, fellas! He challenged Aristotle's idea that everything comes from a substratum, saying it relied too much on induction and analogy, which are flawed ways of explaining things we haven't seen. He basically said, just because you haven't seen something come from nothing doesn't mean it can't happen. Which is fair enough. Maimonides himself thought neither creation nor infinite time could be proven. But some of his Jewish successors, like Gerasonides and Crescus, was like, no, nah, we can figure this out. In the West, you had the Latin Averroists, like Siger of Brabant and Bothius of Dacia, who were all about Aristotle's eternity of the world. They were going head-to-head -head with conservative theologians like John Petchum and Bonaventure, who were all about proving the world had a beginning. Bonaventure even recycled Philoponus' arguments. Thomas Aquinas, like Maimonides, was playing both sides. He said neither eternity nor a finite world could be proven by logic alone. He argued that God could have created the world instantaneously, without preceding it in time. To Aquinas, the world's beginning was an article of faith. The avarice got a smackdown from Stephen Tempere in 1277, and then you've got Giordano Bruno, who famously believed in the eternity of the world. That belief, among others, landed him on the bonfire. So, the medieval period was a real philosophical cage match, with everyone throwing punches over the eternity of the world. You had arguments from logic, arguments from faith, and a whole lot of academic bickering. It was a proper shit show, but a fascinating one at that. Okay, so we've time-traveled from ancient Greece and the medieval brawls to modernity, and guess what? This whole eternity of the world thing is still a damn hot topic. Even with all our fancy science and telescopes that can see back to the dawn of time, we still can't definitively say whether the universe had a beginning or if it's been kicking around forever. You've got folks like Alexander Vilikin, a cosmologist, who's a big believer in the universe having a start date. He's got his theories and equations all pointing towards a cosmic kickoff. But then you've got other scientists who are like, Hold on, mate. An eternal universe is still on the table. They've got their own models and calculations, showing that it's perfectly possible for the universe to have always existed. It's a proper standoff. A tug of war between bang and no bang. And the truth is, we just don't know for sure. We're still grappling with the big questions, like what happened before the Big Bang, or if there even was a before. It's a bit of a humbling thought, isn't it? That even with all our technological wizardry, we're still scratching our heads over the same questions that ancient philosophers were pondering thousands of years ago. The universe, it seems, is still keeping some of the biggest secrets close to its chest, and the questions of its eternity remains one of the most tantalizing mysteries of all. The idea of an eternal world really messes with how we think about existence and our place in it. If the universe has always been here and always will be, it challenges our usual ideas about time and the significance of our own little lives. It's like realizing that the world doesn't revolve around you, that you're just a small part of a much bigger and longer story. It makes you question the meaning of progress, the purpose of life, and what the hell we're all doing here anyway. But, an eternal world also has a certain beauty to it. It suggests that our actions and experiences are part of a grand timeless story, a never-ending play with infinite acts and scenes. It's like realizing that your life is just one chapter in a book that's been written for eternity. This perspective can be awe-inspiring, pushing us to think beyond our limited lifespans and consider the vastness of existence. It might even make you feel a bit insignificant, like a grain of sand on an endless beach. 
but it can also be liberating, freeing you from the pressure of thinking that your life is the only one that matters. In an eternal world, every moment, every action, every experience is part of a larger, timeless story. It's a reminder that we're all connected, that we're all part of something bigger than ourselves, and that our lives have meaning and purpose, even if we can't always see it. So, is the universe eternal, or did it have a beginning? Is time an endless loop, or is it a one-way street? These are some of the biggest questions that have ever been asked, and we're still trying to figure out the answers. But, even if the universe isn't eternal, even if it had a beginning, there's still something awe-inspiring about the vastness of time and the intricate chain of events that led to our existence. So, whether you believe in an eternal world or a finite one, take a moment to appreciate the wonder and mystery of existence. Look up at the stars, contemplate the vastness of time, and ask yourself, what the hell is this all about? Thank you everyone for watching. My name's The Big Why. Don't forget to drop a like, and if you're new to the Why Not family, a follow. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. How do you pronounce this guy's name? Pronunciation. Oh, sick. Nobody fucking knows, I guess. Okay. Critolaus. Critolaus. Another fucking Greek name that I don't know how to pronounce. Proclus? Proclus. Proclus. Oh, I got a fucking ad. Proclus. Okay. Well, <laughs> I hope that's right. Philoponus. Another fucking name. John Philoponus. Philo Philoponus. Another Greek name. Sim Simplic Simplicius. I fucking hate Greek names, dude. Why does all of these... I don't even think that's the right thing. I'm, Simplicius. I'm just going to say Simplicius and hope it's right because it doesn't look like there's even anything on them. So Now, Simplicius of Sic Cilicia. Now, Simplicius of Sicil... Fuck, dude. Now, Simplicius of Cilicia, another Aristotelian commentator and contemporary of Phil... Philipponus. Avicenna? Yeah, cool. Averroes. Averroes. Haha. -ha. I like these, uh, I like these a bit more. <laughs> Maimonides. 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 But Maimonides. Er, but Maimon. But Maimon. Fuck me, dude. Maimonides. 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 Maimonides.